This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. My guest today is someone who needs no introduction. He is one of Bitcoin's best known evangelists, educators and advocates. He is Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Welcome to the show, Andreas. Oh, thank you so much for having me on the show. As we record today, it's the 20th of December 2019, and I think when people listen to this, it'll either be close to the end of the year, or we may even have already crossed over into the new year, the new decade, the 2020s. Andreas, can you believe it? We've made it to 2020? I'm very surprised I made it to 2020, and nowadays I'm also increasingly surprised that humanity is making it to 2020, but let's go for a few more. Sounds good to me. Let's have a bit of background here. Satoshi developed the Bitcoin software as open source code way back in January 2009. And I think it was January 3 when Satoshi mined the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain that of course is now known as the Genesis block. And he famously embedded in the coin base of this block, the text, the Times, 3rd of January 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. So that was 11 years ago now, Andreas, and I thought today it would be a good opportunity for us to perhaps just do a bit of reflection on the first decade of Bitcoin, the first decade of blockchain, talk about where we are now today, where we might go in the second decade of blockchain. So I want to do that. And then in the second part of the show, I'd like to zoom out a little bit and, and look at the world through a science fiction lens and perhaps get some of your perspectives on society, technology, evolution, markets, and, and how all of this intersects. How does that sound? Sounds great. Andreas, look, reflections on the first decade of Bitcoin. What comes to mind? I've been surprised nonstop about new developments that came completely unexpectedly from places and parts of the system that I didn't expect. Surprises, little surprises that kept erupting in this technology field that keep things interesting. If you asked me at the beginning of this uh, to predict some of the developments, things like payment channels and lightning network, smart contracts and virtual machines, all of those things, I would not have been able to predict that these things would be happening as a result of the introduction of Bitcoin. At the same time, equally surprised by the very rapid emergence of human nature as a way to mess everything good up and bring drama, bitterness, and division to things that uh, really do not need it. And we've seen quite a bit of that in this space. But at the same time, I'm full of hope and optimism because I keep meeting amazing people who are committed to these very important principles that we all share about uh, human freedom, about empowerment, about incorporating more individuals into the world economy, about bringing more choices to people around the world, creating a more open, equitable society, including in financial affairs for everybody. And so, you know, so much has happened over 10 years. I remain very optimistic and I'm having the time of my life on this journey. I bet you are. And look, even though it has been a very tumultuous first decade of Bitcoin. From one perspective, there are millions of people around the world that are either holding or using Bitcoin. The Bitcoin network has grown to become one of the largest decentralized networks in the world with an immense amount of computing power directed towards it. The Bitcoin blockchain itself is worth billions and billions of dollars. So even though it's sometimes it, it seems frustrating that we're not quite hitting the mainstream yet. I think if someone said in 2009, 2010, where is this thing going to be in 10 years time? We've come a long way, right? We've come an incredibly long way. I mean, I remember when this was an obscure thing that nobody had even heard of. And now almost the entire world has at least heard of Bitcoin. Now they've heard of it as the shady, weird currency of the internet, pornographers, terrorists, and weirdos, which is all untrue, of course, but nevertheless, they haven't necessarily heard good things about it, but they've heard about it. They've heard about the CEO of Bitcoin being arrested several times. They've heard that Bitcoin has died several times, and they've heard that it's only being used by bad people. 
And then every now and then they keep hearing that it's still alive. It's being used by their dentist or their taxi driver or their hairdresser. And that causes a moment of cognitive dissonance. And in that cognitive dissonance, in that tiny little gap, Bitcoin thrives because it is the story of something that refuses to die, that refuses to conform to expectations and narratives. And that simply is every 10 minutes, like a heartbeat of the internet, continuing to operate reliably. And that's a magical thing. Uh, the 10 years have been incredibly exciting. I think we've gotten further than even I expected. Things are moving faster and faster. Of course, it's not just about what Bitcoin does. It's also about the fact that in that time, the world financial system has grown more fragile. The experiments to stabilize and control it have grown more radical. And the future that traditional systems are building has grown more and more dystopian. So in all of that, the fundamental principles of Bitcoin shine brighter and brighter with each passing year because we keep going deeper and deeper into this very, very dark future that centralization is bringing us. Well, I did want to touch on that, Andreas. So why don't you just give us your quick perspective then on what you think is really going on with the global financial system and you mentioned it's centralized and it's not really a fair playing field for all participants in the market. Where are we heading there? What route is the traditional financial system going down at the moment and how can Bitcoin or the decentralized economy play a part in, in helping to you know, make that system a little bit more fair for everyone? Well, we're currently in the midst of the most radical experiments in the history of uh, monetary economics, and that's not Bitcoin. It's this idea that a healthy economy is one that is carefully controlled from the center, that stability comes from control over interest rates and central banks, that economies can only be healthy if they're stimulated constantly with injections of free money and that uh, societies can only be safe if they're subjected to totalitarian surveillance of all financial transactions and control over all financial endpoints. All of these ideas are not only false, but they've become accepted wisdom without questioning. And this is a toxic situation in formerly free societies that is creating systems that are brittle, fragile in every way, where decisions are made as far removed from the consequences of those decisions and from the knowledge that should inform those decisions in a centralized place, where increasingly radical reactionary authoritarian measures are taken to try to control everything, and where uh, people are constantly being told that they must fear letting go of control and having open systems because those are dangerous. And instead, a safety comes from giving control to a few centralized institutions and people who surely will act in the best interests of everyone. Now, these ideas used to be anathema in free societies after the Enlightenment. And yet here we are with free societies marching straight into very totalitarian ideas. And here's little Bitcoin doing its own thing. The future really represents a choice of digital currency that is central controlled and surveilled and digital currency that is free, open and decentralized. It's no longer a choice between digital or analog currency. And I think that's one of the big misunderstandings. When people look at Bitcoin, they think, oh, it's the future of money because it's digital, whereas our current money is analog. The truth is that analog money is, is not only going out of fashion, but is being actively targeted in a very deliberate program of eradication. Cash is being eradicated from economies around the world in order to reduce people's freedom and to better control the financial system. And that means that our future does not have analog money in it uh, at all. It's going away. It's going away faster than anyone expected. Our future will be a future of pure digital currency, and there'll be a couple of varieties of it. Uh, one variety will be the kind of thing we see emerging in China and uh, other fully techno-surveillance societies, very centralized, very tightly controlled uh, money that feeds into a surveillance state of oppression and control and ultimately leads to concentration camps. And the other form of money, which is open, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer money, 
of the people, by the people, for the people, that no one can seize, confiscate, break, surveil, control, that is completely open to everyone in the world. And that's the direction Bitcoin is going, together with a whole host of other cryptocurrencies and open blockchains. And not everyone's going to make the right choice. But, you know, it is imperative for for the safety of humanity and also for the principles of free, open societies, the principles of the Enlightenment to ensure that we have that choice so that that choice is available to as many people as possible, because the alternative is turning out to be rather dystopian. Yes, it is. And is there a middle ground here, though, Andreas? So if on the one hand you have central bank digital currencies that enable full surveillance by the state, and so that's what China is looking at, on the other hand you have a completely open and decentralized blockchain, that's what Bitcoin is, and then, but you know, governments are in the middle and they are trying to apply different forms of regulations around the world. Of course, the difficulty of that is that it's very difficult to regulate a decentralized protocol. Right. The Bitcoin protocol is, is just code, it's just math, and it, it's an idea. It, it doesn't respect individual nationalist borders. Those are just artificial constructs. And yet, what about things like derivatives products and the Bitcoin ETF? You've spoken about that before you have mixed feelings about the traditional financial system trying to build its own products on top of bitcoin what do you expect to happen there in the next say year or five years or decade ahead i think what we're seeing is a desperate attempt to kind of co-opt and embrace this technology while stripping it of all of its disruptive potential that attempt is going to fail and the reason it's going to fail is because there will always be a free open alternative and that free open alternative may not attract the institutional fiat of uh, centralized organizations that are under strict jurisdictional and regulatory controls. But then again, it will that system will not offer any of the benefits of an open, borderless, neutral, decentralized system. All of these hybrid decentralized leisure technology, closed blockchains that people are building are desperate attempts to forestall the disruption and kind of strip away all of the interesting and disruptive capabilities of this technology. All of these efforts do not in any way threaten really true open blockchains. What they do is they demonstrate the need for them by really showing why those benefits and capabilities are important. In the West, we're not going to see the kind of state control currency as blatantly authoritarian as China. But what we're going to get instead is an unholy alliance of states and corporations that are going to create a myriad of private monies like Libra that are going to be controlled by policies by unelected corporations, not subject to the consent of the governed, and effectively going to take on the role of surveillance and control from the state for a suitable profit, of course. And, you know, we have a name for this kind of unholy alliance between private capital and private corporations and state coercion. It's fascism. And we're marching head on into it. Uh, we're going to get our own version of that in Western developed nations. It's going to be very different from the Chinese one, but it's going to be just as authoritarian. We are going to see many attempts to build alternatives that preserve business as usual, and most importantly, that preserve the fundamental architecture of power in these systems. And you see that temptation in Bitcoin of people who want to work well with the regulators, who want to appease the regulatory framework, who ultimately see nothing wrong with a system that is shaped like a pyramid with the very few powerful at the top. That's not Bitcoin. That's not open blockchains. And it will happen and lots of people will profit handsomely from it. It will neither replace nor will it fulfill the needs that the world has for a, a truly open system that doesn't create that same power architecture. Now we know it can be done. No matter what it's called, no matter how many iterations we go through, uh, we're going to see these open systems emerge again and again and again. As far as the ETFs and the institutional money pouring into this, what they're doing is they're trying to pour fiat that is infinite into a hole to buy crypto that is finite and very, very limited in supply. And some of them are crazy enough to think that they can do cash settlements on this, which means they can find themselves on the wrong end of a market moving very, very rapidly away from them and having to shovel never-ending amounts of fiat to close that hole. 
So that's going to be interesting to see. I don't think it's dangerous for crypto. I think it's very dangerous for the financial institutions that try to do this. It's a bit like when uh, you see a leader of a country say, we're going to resist the foreign exchange speculators and we will keep the peg to whatever, the dollar, gold, and resist all attempts to devalue our currency. And then you watch them shovel billions of dollars into that hole. And in the end, they always fail. It's the same thing here. That's right. And of course, Bitcoin is limited. It is a scarce digital asset with a limited supply. The fiat currency systems are limitless, as you said. And of course, Andreas, in 2020, we have the next Bitcoin halving event, which will happen around May. So that is going to be one of the big narratives of the year. In 2019, Plan B's stock to flow model, that caught a lot of attention as well. Any thoughts from yourself on what you expect to see around the next Bitcoin halving? I can tell you that it will have no effect on the implementation of the consensus rules that will continue to issue one block every 10 minutes, reliably, consistently, and without fail. It will have no effect over the ability of people to do transactions. We might see a small bump in fees as the block subsidy is halved. The fee market may, let's say, heat up. Uh, at least temporarily to compensate. You know, the biggest effect, of course, is that the already limited supply becomes even more limited. Now, I don't know what the economics of that will be, and primarily because it depends on a lot of things that are external to Bitcoin. You know, ultimately, the price of Bitcoin does not simply reflect the value of Bitcoin because you price it in dollars, in New Zealand dollars, in whatever other fiat. And so when you're measuring the exchange rate between Bitcoin and dollars, you're not just measuring the value of Bitcoin because the dollar itself is not an absolute unit that, that doesn't vary. You're measuring both of those things simultaneously. And so it's very hard to say what's going to happen to Bitcoin when there's a hell of a lot happening to the world economy and to the very fragile financial systems that are built on fiat currencies. And one other Bitcoin narrative I just wanted to touch on briefly. In the early days, especially of Bitcoin, Andreas, you know, one of the narratives was that decentralized open networks like Bitcoin have the ability or potential to bank the unbanked. And that, you know, we've made some progress there, we're starting to see some progress there, but that narrative has almost been flipped on its head. And now Bitcoin is being seen as a way to unbank the banked. Yeah. And uh, I think the uh, debank all of us uh, is something that I talked about quite a few years ago. Banking the unbanked without banks is still the goal. Giving economic inclusion is still the goal. And economic inclusion is not something that happens through banking, because um, banking has already ceded that. Uh, they've stopped trying to involve more people in the banking system, and instead we're actually regressing with more and more controls that cut off more and more countries and games of geopolitics. So the reach of banking isn't increasing. In order to bank the unbanked, we have to go beyond banks. We have to think about offering universal access to basic financial services, as I call it. Not universal income, universal access to basic financial services. This idea being that everyone has the ability to access the fundamental financial services that Western developed nations take for granted today. The ability to store value in an account that you control, to transmit that value and make payments, preferably anywhere, anytime without interference. The ability to maintain your privacy, and the ability to invest in a variety of things or buy a variety of things without interference with a unit of money that retains its value. That is a very radical idea. And if we're able to give that to more people, make that available to more people, make the technology simpler, make the user interfaces simpler, reduce the unit cost of the infrastructure and the unit cost of the transactions, the point where everyone can do that, even the most desperately poor people around the world, that can really truly change the world. Of course, it's a highly optimistic scenario and it's a very difficult thing to execute on, but it's also a highly worthwhile scenario. And to me, that is my focus and has been my focus for years now, which is this idea that Bitcoin is not for us, it's for the other six billion.
two things that have happened in, in 2019 that have started to move us closer to that goal. We've seen the rise of decentralized finance, the DeFi movement, and a lot of that has happened in the Ethereum ecosystem. We've also seen the rise of Bitcoin lending platforms. Mm -hmm. You can effectively deposit your coins and either collateralize a loan or get interest on your deposits. What's your take on that? I think these are very interesting experiments that are showing us where we're going to head. The directional aspect of them is very interesting. I think in terms of their current implementation, uh, we have to curtail our expectations a tiny bit and recognize that these are still very early stage experiments that will inevitably contain bugs. And neither the infrastructure nor the user interfaces exist yet to make these accessible to the vast majority of people who need them. Keep in mind, the vast majority of people who need these technologies do not speak English. We have a long way to go, but that doesn't mean we're not going in that direction and that we won't reach there. If you look at early cell phone technology and you see that in order to have a cell phone, you needed a car as big as a Rolls Royce to build it into. And it was a kind of technology that was only accessible to the mega rich. And how that technology has transformed to the point where the mega rich don't even carry a phone. They have a secretary doing that for them. Now, that same technology is in the pocket of pretty much everyone, even in the remotest places in the world. It's an enormously powerful tool. I think we're going to follow a similar trajectory with this technology. It's too early, really, to bank the unbanked. Directionally, we're heading in the right direction. A lot of things need to happen, and a lot of the basic unit costs need to change before we get there. And just to finish off of this section of the show, Andreas, you've spent, I guess, the best part of the last decade traveling the world, talking to people about Bitcoin. You must have presented hundreds, if not thousands of live presentations. You have all of this content on YouTube. You're a prolific podcaster. You're a prolific tweeter. What has that been like for you? And is this a mission for you? Have you succeeded in your mission? And where is it going next? Yeah, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what that's been like and whether you feel that has been a worthwhile investment of your time. Are you going to keep doing it for the next decade? I'm as surprised as anybody else. It's astonishing. It's not something that I had hoped for or even aimed for. It caught me quite by surprise that some of my work has been able to reach uh, so many people and it grew much faster than I expected. I've always been interested in teaching and I've always taught with an element of passion about the technologies that I think are important in this world and that I see in my unique perspective, at least, that will change the world. When I came across Bitcoin, it generated inside me a, a, an enthusiasm that I felt I had to tell other people about it. And very early on, from 2013, the mission became clear to me and the mission was educate as many people as possible in as many languages as possible around the world about the technology, but also the social, economic, political impact of this technology, uh, Bitcoin and open blockchains in general, the systems that obey the five or six primary capabilities of being open, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, immutable, publicly verifiable, etc. That mission started uh, in a very simple way. Can I educate thousands of people by doing videos? Can I educate tens of thousands of people by doing books? And then it escalated beyond my wildest expectations. This month, I'm going to exceed 10 million views on my YouTube channel, uh, which means that my goal that I set in 2017 of educating at least 10 million people around the world uh, has been already exceeded if just YouTube, considering that there are many other platforms. And going from 10,000 to 100,000 to a million to 10 million has been a crazy logarithmic scale experience. Uh, riding the logarithmic dragon is a weird experience on a personal basis. It's also a weird experience as an entrepreneur trying to scale operations to do that. I'm now very fortunate to have an almost army of volunteers helping me in this mission. I have a staff of 10. I have thousands of people contributing with monthly subscriptions on Patreon to allow me to continue to do this with a neutral uh, voice without relying on corporate sponsorship, which funds my entire staff and an army of volunteers who translate my work, uh, putting subtitles on my videos, for example, in 31 different languages on all 460 videos that I've published so far, translating my books into 14 different languages, and it keeps growing. 
So what's my goal? The mission is exactly the same. What changes is only the scale. And the next step in this scale is 100 million people by the end of 2022. It takes a lot of us to do this. It's a whole community working towards that same singular goal. I may be the public face of some of this work, but it's not just my work. It's it's the work of thousands of people working together to a common goal. And I encourage you to visit my sites, gain access to all of this information, uh, but also help and support me. Fantastically said, Andreas. And look, on behalf of myself and the listeners, we thank you for your good work and, and I wish you all the best success with that. The pleasure is all mine and I absolutely mean that. This is the most fun I've had in my entire life and I am doing exactly what I love to do and having the freedom to do what I love is the greatest gift that this community has given me. Amazing. Let's take a quick break, Andreas, and then let's get into the good stuff. Strap yourself in. We're going down a science fiction rabbit hole. Crypto, the asset class that doesn't sleep. The markets move quickly with profits made and lost around the clock. It's a whirlwind and you've got to keep up. You need enhanced tools that deliver timely data and accurate analytics so you can make informed decisions. You need BNC Pro a customizable, institutional-grade suite of applications to help you manage your crypto investments all in one place. Get accurate market data, track your trades or custom holdings, and see profit and loss at a glance. Monitor any asset, trading pair, or exchange using Brave New Coin's trusted market data. Integrate BNC Newsfeed and filter it to deliver only the news that matters to you. Never miss an opportunity, save time, and make better informed decisions. Finally, the all-in-one terminal experience you need to master this brave new asset class. BNC Pro, launching Q4 2019. Join the waitlist today at bravenewcoin.com. Andreas, I'm going to tell you a story. Stop me when this starts to become familiar. The scene is the near future. A woman is attempting to make toast for breakfast, but there's a problem. Her toaster runs software that means it will only- Oh yes, <laughs> uh, unauthorized just... bread. <laughs> Correct, so the problem yes. here, I'll just finish this off for the listeners. The toast will only make bread that is sold by the same company that makes the toaster. However, it transpires that the company has gone out of business, so there's no way to buy toaster compatible bread and the toaster is useless. What's the story? Andreas? Well, the, the story is about control over the things in our environments and whether we, in fact, own the things that are around us. It's the story of not your keys, not your coins, as my uh, famous slogan from 2013 has become a rallying cry in crypto, transported to life as a whole, which is what in your environment do you actually own and what do you simply lease and use only at the pleasure of some corporation that may or may not exist anymore. This difference between ownership and being temporary renters in our human experience is a terrifying story and is made for excellent sci-fi. The, the section you read, of course, uh, from Cory Doctorow's latest book, Radicalized, one of my favorite authors in the world, and a collection of four stories about the dystopian future we're building, and that one is called Unauthorized Bread. That is exactly correct. It just feels to me that this is a story about the near future. It's very similar to what Black Mirror does, right? You well, know, I mean, not near future, no. It's a story of our recent past sure. or even our current present. Any one of our listeners have a Keurig coffee maker that will only brew Keurig pots? Absolutely. They've introduced DRM. The story of unauthorized bread is the story of today's unauthorized coffee pods. Exactly. I recently went to a party and brought coffee pods with me because I knew the host had a Keurig. <laughs> uh, this was a Thanksgiving party and uh, arrived there and discovered we couldn't brew because the pods that I had were unauthorized. And I honestly wanted to smash that piece of junk into a thousand pieces. You're exactly right. It is the story of now. This is our current timeline. It's Black mm -hmm. Mirror. It's the internet of things gone wrong. And mm -hmm. if you just extrapolate out a little bit of our technology, add in a hefty dose of surveillance capitalism, digital rights management, and some crappy product design, and the future starts to look a little bit weird, doesn't it? Yes, it's it's already looking very weird. We were promised flying cars, and instead what we get is the boring dystopia. But we can find 
fight back. And we can fight back when we recognize that hackers are not the enemies. They are the heroes of this future. They are the ones that take your bricked toaster that cannot toast an authorized bread, or even your bricked Keurig that has a little sensor inside it, and they hack it, change the firmware, and liberate it and give it back to you so you have ownership. Something that in many countries is illegal, but not only uh, moral, but in fact, uh, an expression of justice. Uh, when you're looking at this kind of boring techno dystopia, you have to make some very, very hard distinctions between legality, morality, and justice. And people who uh, break small, immoral, and unjust laws in order to achieve larger moral purposes are heroes of this modern era. They're persecuted, but they are heroes. The Snowdens, the Assanges, the Barretts, all of these people who speak truth to power and break the systems of control are the heroes of the modern era. And we should teach our children to celebrate that kind of behavior. Absolutely. Here's another example that speaks to, I think, the the strange state of the modern world that we live in, Andreas. So Franz Streiner, who is the founder of Brave New Coin, he's a big science fiction guy. He's a Star Trek guy. And when he founded the company Brave New Coin, he used Brave New Coin as a play on Brave New World by Adolis Huxley. Brave New World was published in 1932. It's a very famous dystopian science fiction novel. And it's often compared to that other very famous dystopian sci-fi novel which was published in 1949 and that of course is 1984 by George Orwell. Mm -hmm. If you'll allow me to just share a very quick let's call it a poem. So oh, please yes. And then I'd, I'd love to get your comment. My favorite. Com I'd love to get your comments on a blockchain context. Andreas. George Orwell feared those who would ban books. Huxley feared that there would be no reason to ban a book because no one would want to read. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information, whereas Huxley feared we would be given so much information we couldn't process it at all. Orwell feared that the truth would be hidden from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture. So in 1984, people are controlled by inflicting pain and in Brave New World, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. And these are two diametrically opposed visions of a possible dystopian future, but both of those futures have literally come to life around us right now, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. These have been fundamental books for me that formed my impressions as a young child were critical in my thinking and, and also in my involvement in Bitcoin. And in the end, we got both. I don't know which one is more terrifying. Right now, we're seeing the 1984 future first played out in the Soviet Union, now it's playing out in communist China. It's a very hard-edged dystopia of brutality, suppression, concentration camps, violence, executions, etc. But we're also seeing the dystopia of Aldous Huxley playing out in the United States, in Britain, in Australia, and New Zealand, which is this sugar-coated, nobody cares to vote anymore, being led by the nose, uh, numbed by Kardashians and drama on a daily basis, numbed by entertainment, and losing track of the truth because it's surrounded by triviality. And both are coming true simultaneously. And in fact, neither stands alone. They, they have a, a hybrid. You know, you're lulled into submission in the entertainment space unless, unless you wake up for a moment and take a stand against the American empire, in which case you find yourself in a dungeon being tortured by the apparatus of the state. So you can flip from Huxley to Orwell at any moment in time. There are simply the edges and you can find yourself thrown from one to the other. It's a difficult uh, world that has emerged, not that much more difficult than what our parents and grandparents' generation went through. And this is the one that we have to tackle. I'm cautiously optimistic. Even though these dystopias are emerging, so are surprising people movements, technology movements, and tools that we can use to fight those. You would be a member of Generation X, Andreas? Well, I, I have the theory of the three generations, which is the generation I was born in, and then I have the aspirational and the desperational generation. So I am born Gen X, I aspire to be a millennial, and I despair if someone thinks I'm a boomer. Wow, I think you just described me. <laughs> but, um, Every generation has that, right? Exactly. Ours most strongly because uh, because the boomers are cursed.
Yes. I'm guessing then that you remember way back in, in the 70s, do you remember a kind of a lurid airport bestseller, a kind of a, a schlocky book by Alvin Toffler called Future Shock? Oh, yes, um, which I read as a 14-year-old, and it was a fascinating book. Yeah, so I read that book around the same time. We're probably of a similar age, you and I, but Toffler's essential warning was that, and he's writing this in the 70s, he said that in the decades ahead, millions of ordinary, psychologically normal people will face an abrupt collision with the future, creating shattering stress and disorientation by subjecting them to too much change in too short a time. And it kind of feels, Andreas, you know, that that's what's coming at us in the 2020s because, you know, we're humans, we're fragile biological creatures with some fairly basic primitive urges, but we have an unusually large and powerful brain, but we're not really prepared evolutionary for the kind of exponential change that, you know, the world is facing. Right. And, and that has a direct relationship to this little experiment of ours, Bitcoin uh, and the new form of digital money that's being introduced. Because if you think about it, money is one of the most ancient technologies we have. By some measures, it precedes writing. And in fact, the very first writing uh, was invented in order to encode the accounting ledgers of money. And so money is a technology. First of all, it is uh, a human artifact that has emerged from human civilization, um, but it is very, very old. Um, it is one of the first languages. And as a result, it's so deeply embedded in our culture as to have become invisible and uh, not even recognized as a technology. It almost has this mythical, philosophical meta status in society uh, in that people assume some mythologies about it and never question those and treat it with almost religious reverence without understanding its fundamental workings. But over this period of tens of thousands of years, uh, money has undergone four or maybe five fundamental transformations, transformations from early systems of barter-based and uh, token-based economies based on shells, feathers, and things like that, to precious metals, to fiat and debt-based mechanisms of credit cards, and now, today, over the past decade, to fully abstract network-based protocol money. You know, if you've only had four or five transitions, you know, people think, the transition to Bitcoin is pretty radical, but imagine the transition to paper certificates that represented gold that you no longer held. Uh, arguably, that's even more radical. It took about 400 years for people to swallow that particular pill um, <laughs> with great reluctance uh, and uh, quite a bit of violence, too. When you change something so fundamental to human society and civilization, it takes a while for people to adapt. So when it comes to colliding with a discontinuous future that is difficult to grasp and understand, as Alvin Toffler described it, Bitcoin is a big chunk of that. It, it is going to be a very radical, very difficult to absorb change, but it is inevitable. It is absolutely inevitable. It's already happened. Now the question is how these consecutive waves of change and adaptation, as again, as Tafla described them in his, uh, the third wave of futurism, as these hit different societies, how these societies adapt to that change. And, and like all other futuristic change, this is fundamentally generational. Today, we have a basic generational shift in the perception of money, economics, banking, and society that occurs right around my generation, really. We're the pivot point. Uh, people over 50 or 60 today uh, who represent the previous generation cannot fathom a system of money based on the internet without thinking it's some kind of bizarre scam that is unnatural and shouldn't exist. Uh, people under 30 cannot understand a system of money controlled by 12 elderly people who, who meet once a month to decide how the economy works in, in an antiquated system of mainframes and pieces of paper. And to them, internet money is absolutely natural in the way things should be, and they can't quite understand why it's not already happening. And then there's our generation stuck in between. 
aspirational millennials who want to see the future of money come sooner, desperational boomers who are uh, trying to break free from the past and stuck somewhere in the middle. It really is an astonishing time to be alive. Fantastically said, Andreas. Let's go to another quick break and then we will finish off with the Crypto Conversation Hot Take Ground. Whether you're an enterprise fund manager or a retail trader, buying and selling cryptocurrencies successfully requires price discovery you can rely on. Brave New Coin's liquid indices provide trusted US dollar prices for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Featuring end of day or intraday outputs, you can count on the BLX, ELX, and XRPLX for accurate US dollar pricing for smart contract oracles, settlement price discovery, net asset valuation, and performance analysis. Visit bravenewcoin.com to find out more. Andreas, I like to finish each Crypto Conversation podcast with a quick round of rapid fire hot takes. Are you up for it? Yep, let's do this. All right, Mr. Andreas Antonopoulos, it's the Crypto Conversation hot take round. Where do you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist to multi-coin opportunist spectrum? I'm definitely not a maximalist. From 2015, I started speaking about a multi-coin future, not because I want one, but because I think human nature leads us to that. And so far, the data seems to be going in that direction. I think we're going to have a parallel distribution of many coins with a long tail of thousands of coins, chains, tokens, and systems for different applications for different groups. Uh, that's just the way we're going. I think you're probably right. Andreas, what would you say is your firmest conviction crypto opinion? My firmest conviction and crypto opinion is that we need a system of open money and that in the long run, open systems beat closed systems because they give the greatest number of opportunities for people to innovate at the edge. Let's put you on the spot. I like to ask every guest this question. Andreas, who wins the American presidential election 2020? I'm guessing Trump wins uh, again for the same reasons he won last time, which is I'm guessing the Democrats are going to nominate a moderate Republican uh, and the young people are going to stay home just like happens in Britain. Uh, and I'm not too happy with that outcome, though I don't believe the Democrats are running a pretty good campaign. Uh, I do believe that having a narcissistic, deranged mobster as the head of your government is dangerous. Andreas, UBI as a potential fix for AI-induced automation. What do you think? Is this a good idea? I think that uh, since the amount of economic production that happens in the world is enough to feed everyone, the fact that we now work longer than ever and more and more people are slipping behind basic necessities is, is tragic and verging on criminal. From that perspective, I think the first step is universal basic access to financial services. Giving more people access to financial services will increase prosperity overall. Open systems, I think, are very important there. You know, when it comes to UBI, uh, it's all in the implementation details. As a principle, I think if people have some of their basic needs covered so they're not uh, suffering for food and shelter, they can self-actualize and develop uh, enormous productive potential. But on the other hand, if that's implemented through centralized coercion and picking winners, then that's very dangerous. So it depends. Uh, maybe UBI as an algorithm might work. Hey, Andreas, Bill Gates famously said we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. What does blockchain, Bitcoin, decentralized everything, what does it look like in 10 years time? I think in 10 years time, it disappears into the background and using Bill Gates as your example, Bill Gates said that, you know, Linux was just a fad and uh, was something that everybody would ignore. And then it runs the entire internet, every phone, almost every phone out there is now a, a Unix Linux style system. All of the web servers are that. And in fact, it's at the core of Windows. So <laughs> he tried to embrace and extend Unix and Unix embraced and extended Microsoft. 
Microsoft instead. I think in the future, people will be using blockchains and probably or almost especially Bitcoin without even knowing they're using it. And I think we're going to see what I call the infrastructure inversion, where people build simulations of the traditional banking system on top of blockchains until you can't even see their exist. I love it. Andreas William Gibson said, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Can you think of an example of the future being here right now, but most people aren't really aware of it? Well, absolutely. Uh, first of all, in the space of uh, Bitcoin, I can have a thousand conversations in New York about why someone would do Bitcoin. And the moment I arrive in Argentina, nobody cares to discuss that. They already know why. They want to know how. Uh, and the reason is because they live in a completely different reality where their government and their banks are already corrupt criminals trying to destroy their future. So they don't really need persuading. They just need means to access it. That future of Bitcoin is already unevenly distributed around the world. But there's also other aspects of, of technology that are unevenly distributed. You know, just watching Hong Kong, for example, fight, fight an insurrection against the technological surveillance dystopia uh, is fascinating. They're fighting the kinds of battles that sci-fi and cyberpunk authors wrote about two decades ago. And now we're seeing this happening in the streets and they're learning and teaching the entire world how to do it. The future is very, very weird and, and it is very unevenly distributed. Exactly right. We're almost done, Andreas. Tell me though, why is it important to keep the digital communities weird? Because weird is the understanding that uh, human nature exists on a very broad spectrum of experience, uh, belief, creativity, and expression. And that humanity is best if it broadens rather than narrows that range. Weird is simply the outlier from the bell curve. And that's where a lot of the best ideas, the most creativity, the most passion comes from. If we only look to the center of the bell curve, what we get is only the repetition of history and tradition. Everything new, everything novel, everything creative, everything different comes from the edges. So keeping it weird is a societal wide call uh, that recognizes that humanity is infinite and cannot be captured in the finite. Let's zoom out, Andreas. What is the long-term future for the human race? Do you see dystopia or utopia? I see both. Just like the future is here, it's unevenly distributed. Uh, so is dystopia, so is utopia. Fortunately, I think we're going to have a lot of messy in between and a lot of opportunities to correct our course when we see it's not working. The only permanent thing is going to be unrelenting change. Couldn't agree more. And finally, Andreas, what is your favorite science fiction book, film, show, or universe? Of course, it would be Star Trek. Not a big fan of Star Wars, because not a big fan of wars, but Star Trek as this utopian society where money doesn't exist, where everybody's self-actualized and has risen above material needs. Um, and when there are strict principles of respect for uh, other cultures and non-interference, yeah, I mean, that has to be probably the best of all of the uh, sci-fi shows. And of course, I'm talking about The Next Generation with Jean-Luc Picard. You'd be surprised at how many people pick not only Star Trek, but also the next generation as their favorite flavor of the Star Trek universe, shall we say. I would not be surprised. Thank you so much for talking to me, Andreas. So the microphone is yours. Take us out. Please tell the people what you've got going on, where they can find you on your various platforms. I think you've got a new book out. The Internet of Money, Volume 3 is out. The microphone is yours. Take us away. Uh, my latest book, The Internet of Money, Volume 3, was just published in paperback and ebook. Audiobook is coming soon. This is the third volume in a collection of talks that now spans six years uh, from the Internet of Volume 1, 2, and 3 now. I'm now working on my next book, which is Mastering the Lightning Network, due to be published in uh, the fourth quarter of 2020, which is a college-level textbook on how the Lightning Network works. And uh, of course, I continue to publish videos in 31 languages uh, on YouTube, more than 460 videos. All of my work is available for free to share, read, access, repurpose, and uh, reproduce under different licenses, mostly Creative Commons attribution licenses. 
And uh, my work is sponsored entirely by the community through patreon.com and individual donations so that I can continue to do a mission of education that is neutral and not uh, promoting specific corporate interests. Amazing. And finally, Andreas, will you come back and see us in New Zealand again? Uh, that is tremendously challenging. Uh, New Zealand passed some of the most draconian laws about uh, encryption checks of devices at the border. Uh, requiring people to not only turn over passwords, but imposing not only financial but criminal penalties on people who refuse to. Uh, in order to visit New Zealand, I'd have to uh, arrive electronically naked and <laughs> disconnected from the world because I can't I can't move across that border uh, with devices. Fortunately, New Zealand has chosen the path of uh, fear and totalitarian control when it comes to these things. And that makes it difficult for me to visit, even though I'd love to visit again and again. I've been there uh, twice already. We'll have a word to the government here and let them know your concerns and see if we can prod them to, to heading back in a, in a better direction. Well, please do, because I had a, a last year, I had uh, started planning a tour to Australia and New Zealand, which would have been my third Oceania tour. And I had to cancel it after both Australia and New Zealand passed laws that would make it impossible for me to, to get through that border without uh, severe problems. Okay, well, well, we'll talk to Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, see what she <laughs> says. Thank you very much, Andreas. An absolute pleasure. You are a legend. All the best for the new year and the decade ahead. All right. Well, there you go. Such a pleasure to talk to Andreas, a true Bitcoin legend. And welcome to 2020, a brand new year and a brand new decade. Thank you so much to everyone who has listened to any of the Crypto Conversation podcasts. We launched this podcast in June 2019 and the podcast has really started to kick off in the last few months. We've put out 23 episodes, had on some amazing guests on the show. I think we've put out some, some pretty good crypto content along the way. We had some really big guests, people like Mark Yusko, John McAfee, Sergei Nazarov, and now Andreas Antonopoulos. I think we've had a, a really good run, and I can't wait to see where this podcast will go in 2020. And of course, where Bitcoin, blockchain, and cryptocurrency, where the whole ecosystem can evolve and continue in 2020 and beyond. So please make sure you keep it locked to the crypto conversation. It's going to be a ride. To do that, please make sure you subscribe to the podcast and whatever podcast app you are using look if you liked my conversation with Andreas please tell me what you thought please leave us a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts and iTunes leave us a review that would be amazing drop me an email andy at bravenewcoin.com or get at me on twitter at andy pickering nz you know, and the funny thing about this Andreas podcast is it was recorded a few days before Christmas. For me, it was literally, it was 7 a.m. in the morning, the morning after the Brave New Coin Christmas party. And for Andreas, it was the end of a long day of interviews for him. He'd done three or four on the trot. And yet, I reckon Andreas and I, we pulled it off. We had a good chat. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Anyway, for now... I think I'm pretty much out of here. Summer is in the air here in NZ and, you know, the, the country is pretty much off to the beach. So we will see you in 2020. Keep it locked. Keep it crypto. But bye for now. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave New Coin 